Hello, I'm comedian Mark Thomas. You really should join me on Paul Barossi's Humorology podcast. Where we're discussing timing. See you there. This is part two with the shy, retiring wallflower that is Mark Thomas. Enjoy. We had Ahmed Jalili on a while ago and he said comedians are people who need the laughter of strangers to validate us. We're all mentally ill. Of course um, we are. Of course we are. <laughs> Our job is to get complete strangers to like us. Of course we're bloody something's wrong with us. Well, and to make an involuntary act, usually in a darkened room. And, and also, I, I, I'd, I'd argue that there are comics amongst us, uh, Jerry Sadowick being a prime example, who will get you to laugh at him and like him despite himself. Yes, exactly. Oh, Oh, just uh, Jerry actually changed a bit of the face of the comedy store, didn't he? When he came uh, first of all, I mean, he was he was incredible because he was just like had no no boundaries. No, he was re he was remarkable. He could take that room and shake it apart. Yeah, and say things that, uh, that we should explain to the listener that in the original, in inverted commas, alternative comedy scene. It was based on no racist, no sexist, um, because we'd come off the back of, you know, Bernard Manning and all those kind of people. And yet he would do stuff that was on the edge of all those things and yet get away with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And But because he was he was not only funny, but he had a point and a purpose quite often behind mm. vitriol. Um <clears throat> I was reminded just as you speaking there, I saw John, I was with John Cooper Clark the other day and uh, we were at the Larn Festival and um, <clears throat> it, it, it was with the Larn Festival, a small festival in Wales, it's brilliant, it's beautiful, about 600 people go and there are three venues and you go from the church hall to the community hall to the pub, right, and and you get like Linton Quasi Johnson was there, the poet, wow. you know, Colin Grant, the novelist was there, you know, John Cooper Clark was there, Eliza Carthy there, who was, you know, the great folk singer. Um, <clears throat> and it was amazing. It's an amazing, Martin Rosen, the Guardian cartoonist, you know, um, who is absolutely outrageous. And uh, remind me to show you something at the end of Martin's. So what it was, was... <clears throat> we had that classic moment where we scrambled for a gag because i i said oh john he said you're right man i said yeah good how are you we started chatting and he said are you gigging tonight i said i am but i was gigging last night in this pub that because they and just everyone takes turns it's like a free-for-all there's loads of poets and comics and and he said we're really good i said it was great there's a bagpipe player on after me he went bloody hell i said i know it's not a background instrument is it you never hear the phrase ambient bagpipe. And he went, that's an oxymoron. It's more of an oxymoron than casual sex. And he said, I'll put that one in my set. I said, I'm having it first. And there's a scramble for ambient bagpipe. <clears throat> but the reason, the reason that I mentioned John was that he got his first gigs with Bernard Manning. Wow. He got his first gigs with Bernard Manning and John Cooper Clark, for those who don't know, is a poet. And one of his first poems was about a Salford club uh, called the Ritz that everyone knew, everyone knew. <clears throat> and the poem used to start, I was walking down the road in what you might just call the mold when you saw them spinning all the smash hits from the mecca of the modern dance, the Ritz. My feet did the foxtrot, my shoulders did the shimmy, the bouncers at the door said, hey, gimme, gimme, gimme. I gave them the money, they gave me the shits. There's no healthy argument in the Ritz. Anyway, it goes on. <sighs> Standing by the light of the fag machine, she illuminated me with her Iranian gleam. She had a bar lacquer on her hair and a bar uh, and something on her lips. And Salome Maloney, Queen of the Ritz. And it's about this dancer, Salome Maloney. And the last line of it, she falls off her stiletto wheels and broke her fucking neck. Anyway, 
that's everyone knew the club. Everyone in Salford knows the club. That so you know, so you're doing something about something that everyone knows that you share, that you understand. And he did it for Bernard Manning when he went for his audition. And Bernard Manning apparently sat there chuckling, going, fell off a stiletto wheels, fucking funny as that. Broke her neck, funny as fuck. <laughs> oh my god. It was that that's where he got his first breaks. And I and I wouldn't for one minute begin to defend Bernard Manning's. Right, uh, a deep misogyny and racism uh, that went on with him. But he, there was a there, there was a shared experience which shouldn't be thrown out. No, and 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 by the way, that he had exceptional timing. He was amazing. His timing was brilliant. He he had a thing. Ken Dodd and him shared this thing, which is you could be laughing at the first joke while he was telling the third. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So you were beaten into submission. It was it was amazing. Uh, that's a, but all these comics and everything. You were talking about Robin Williams. We were talking about Robin Williams, and I, it just suddenly flashed into my head that Billy Crystal line about uh, Robin Williams is that he needed those extra little hugs that you can only get from strangers. Yeah, and and is that true? Is that why? People want to make other people laugh. Is uh, strangers laugh? What what do we need from that? As human beings, we need that. Why would you want strangers hating you? Do you know what I mean? Th- th- this is the thing about. I never quite get my head around Twitter. <laughs> Why would you want strangers hating you? Do you know what I mean? Um, when we tell jokes, we it's a way of of. There's a communication that goes on that validates us, that we can be the person at the bottom of the pile. We can be the person who's the weakest part of any team. Do you know what I mean? We can be the person who is gets the lowest marks or whatever. But when we tell jokes, we're kings. Beautifully put. Yeah. So it's what it is. It's an evening up of society, isn't it? Because some people can you know punch really hard with their fists some people can actually do a punchline well that's what i've had you know people say to me he said you're you're very much like your dad except you use your words Uh, i'll tell you a story i'll tell you it was told to me so it's not my story and it belongs to a lovely performer and writer called gary mcnair who did a show about billy Connolly, and is in fact developing it it's beautiful Beautiful story. And he, they, instead of doing a show about Billy Connolly telling his life, they just talk to people about what Billy Connolly meant to them, which changes the whole thing. Colony is like in Scotland, he is the nearest thing you've got to Godhead. And they did this, they did a show, they did a, a, a kind of reading of the play at this small community centre. And the community centre was famous for its local art exhibitions, for, for local people doing their art exhibitions. And one year they got Billy Connolly to do it. It's in the 70s. And Billy Connolly came to do it. And so it's right that they did this show in this community centre. And they had curry. These people made curry. The community centre made curry. So you get nourishment. right? This is the thing. You get physical nourishment and you get spiritual nourishment. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that and that's what I think is brilliant about it. You know, even when you see Les Dennis, Scampi and Chips, that's what it is. You know, and it's very basic form. It's physical and spiritual nourishment. Right. And so they got all curries handed out to people. They did the show. And at the end of it, people got up to tell their stories. So it literally becomes about sharing. Right. You've suddenly turned it into a group, into something where we're all becoming that we've gone beyond the laughter and the sharing of the laughter. We're now sharing stories with each other. And this woman gets up and said, this bowl of curry I made tonight and it's because of Billy Connolly. Said he came here to open the art exhibition and I bumped into him because he went around the town before doing it. I bumped into him and we got chatting and I said, oh, I'm I'm a Buddhist, but I'm not quite sure what I want to do in my life. And I got chatting with him about this and that. And he was really receptive, really nice. Anyway, comes through the art exhibition. He sees me at the back of the room and goes, oh, there's that Buddhist. There's my Buddhist friend. So she said, I thought I'd be cheeky. And she said, I wrote him a long letter and sent it to his management. And in it, I said, look, I've, I'm, I, I, it was lovely meeting you. And I don't know why, but 
I just feel I'm after something in life and I'm debating whether I should go in the pool and I haven't got any money, but I think I may be. So Billy Connolly sent her a check back with the airfare. Wow. And she went out there. I think she was out there for eight years. And she said, and this is where I learned to make this curry. So literally this curry is because of Billy Connolly, but it doesn't stop there because she said, my nephew is a tailor and works at a kilt maker and was working with Billy Connolly's kilt. And she knew that Billy Connolly would be coming in for a fitting. So she wrote another letter to Billy Connolly explaining everything, what she'd done with the money, what she thought she'd found, what she thought she'd achieved and what she thought she'd brought back to Scotland. And the nephew gives it to Billy Connolly, who opens it, promptly bursts into tears and says, I always wondered what happened to her. Oh, oh no. That's the gang. That's our gang. It's such a privilege to be even in the gang, isn't it? And and uh, I do you think that humor is a superpower? Well, I mean, I'm not afraid of kryptonite. <laughs> I never ever. I never ever. Take the piss tonight. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Superman, Banksy's put a B on your S. (laughs) (laughs) I think. I mean, because we obviously not get lots of people around the world who listen to this who aren't in show business and of no want to be. But everybody has to connect. Everybody has to. do you think the, the difference between a good communicator and a great communicator is simply one thing, humour? I think you can put it down to this, actually. You can look at it as humour, or you can look at it, I'm a big jazz fan, and I think if you communicate well, you have to listen well. And all good comics listen. It's not funny because I talk about this a lot, about the fact that all the best comedians are listening to the audience at all times. And actually, one of the things I love about your stand-up, and and probably that answers my question of why 38 years later you are still as vital and still doing as much, is because you are listening to the audience at all time and listening happens with the eyes as well it's not just the ears it's the senses it's feeling what they are and where you can take them and where you can dance with them really yeah yeah that's it dance is absolutely what it is George Carlin's great quote you know comedy is not about rushing over the boundaries it's about dancing backwards and forwards do you know what I mean? It's a beautiful thing. You take them over, you bring them back. You take them over, you bring them back. I'm going to treat you all right. Don't worry. I've taken you over again. Don't worry. Here we are. But isn't the first thing you have to get is that rapport with the audience? And uh, what what do you do out of interest? Because we like to, people to be able to take something away from this as well. What What do you think you do that allows you that time? Because I think I know what you do. Is, uh, but you explain what you think you do that uh, allows you that time on stage, because in comedy, you know, especially where we come from, you got about 30 seconds grace and then you were off. What are you doing, do you think? That's... I'll tell you the thing, the physical thing that I always used to do, Bob Boynton noticed it. He said to me, whenever you walk on stage, because the comedy store, stay, the, the, the seats and the tables were right up. You, literally, you're standing in the midst of them. He said, whenever you walk on stage, he said, you walk up to that microphone, take a sip of your drink and put it on the table in front of you. And he said, it's like in that little moment, you go, this is my gaff. Spatial um, marking, I, I would call that in psychological terms, is where you go, I own this. Yeah. It's all right, everyone. This is fine. I've done it before. You'll be all right. But that's the thing it goes back to teachers, doesn't it? But we any school, anybody listening to this went to, we could all as an audience of class smell the teacher who couldn't cope. And and it's a it's about 
I've you just said the words I've got this and that's really all they want to know isn't it my, my mate was, was went to teach training college and he said um he said there's a famous story of a teacher who was coming up for his assessment and they had a, a, a you know the assessor coming in to see whether he was going to go on to qualify and he walked into a particularly difficult classroom uh just opened his briefcase got out four bricks to each side put a put a, a little tile in front of it and just went and smashed the tile and just went, right, maths. <laughs> he failed. He failed. <laughs> oh, God, that's extraordinary. That's an extreme example of marking your territory. But it is about, I mean, because anybody getting up, everybody at some stage in their life has to get up in front of somebody, whether that's at a wedding or a funeral or or something. There is that, uh, or a business, you know, work events. You know, I think, I mean, even, like, I do a little book club once a month and we do it on Zoom. And we just, and, and it's just a small group of us on Twitter called the Lazy Reader Club. And we just choose a different book and then read it and then we discuss it as a group. And it's lovely. And I've got to know these people. They're lovely, lovely people. I really, really like them. And we have a little thing. And it's always about going, do you, do you want to speak or you don't have to? And then saying, all right, you put something in the comments. I've got the comments. And it's about looking after people, enabling them to come forward. Everyone's got something worth saying. But even if they can't get up and speak in front of, you know, on the Zoom call and go, well, this is what I feel about the book. I, I feel it. You know, may, maybe they feel a little bit inhibited about that. They can still write it down. And it's about getting people to move. Uh, there's there's one woman who I adore on the group who is just, who was so much, she was like, I'm in a book group. I've never been in a book group before. And she said, I've never spoken before. This is my first time speaking. And everyone was just like really supportive and lovely. And you're right, everyone has to at some point engage with the world, whether it's on a Zoom call or whether we did this thing once we used to do um, sort of just drama therapy at this um, uh, an institution for mental health. And uh, we're working with some fairly long term residents and we would do things where people just would do simple tasks because we sometimes forget that. For some people, the most simple tasks are really anxious. They're really full of anxiety. And one bloke describes, he said, he said he was sent out on a task of getting leaflets from, uh, I think it was, an it, was, it was a showroom. Do you know what I mean? And he went in there and he went into the wrong showroom. And he, he said uh, electric instead of gas. Right, which shows how long ago it was. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's a, it's a gas showroom rather than electric or whatever. And the bloke was embarrassed and went off. And so the next week we all did, we did sort of like role play about what happens when you make little mistakes. Because uh -huh. all of us need those help. We all need that help. There's always situations that make us anxious, that makes us constricted. You know, and it can be social, it can be job, it can be societal, whatever. And we've all got to give each other a break. I think the mis misnomer or misapprehension for everyone uh, in um, uh, out there thinks that you were born with this talent to be able to do this, and I, I think it's learnt. I think you're, I think you're right. I think you're right about that. I think kindness is also learnt, Paul. Yes. I think kindness is learned, and I think that's really important. I was doing a gig recently, and um, I told a story about Barry Cryer, about his funeral, and about what his funeral was like. And it was funny, because Arthur Smith was there, and Arthur's always funny. You know, it was a great old story, big laugh, and this woman drunk comes up and said, "Just go, I, I met Barry Cryer, and, and I wanted to affirm what you've said. And she was a bit pissed. And it was towards the end of the show, and I just went, come on then, and gave her a microphone and just sat down next to her on the front of the stage. And a bit pissed, she just told the story of meeting him in a Chinese restaurant and how kind he was. And I cracked him with a couple of gags that weren't aimed at her. And when she'd finished the story, she went back. And for me, it's taken 38 years to know how to handle kindness 
to be able to let that woman be herself and go back without hurting them. No, that's beautiful because I think that's that's underrated kindness, isn't it? And I I think because the whole humorology project is really I always say it's not about comedy. I go, it's about humanity. It's about humility and yeah. good humor. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Anyone can tell a joke, you know, a, a, you know, about someone else and let them be the butt. You've got to be yeah. able to let yourself. You've got to be. You've got to have self-deprecation. You've got to be able to laugh and mock the right people. And you've, Which, got let, you've also got to stand back. One of the things that I love about heckling, I love heckling, by the way, right? Yeah. I adore it. And it's not a matter of going, bang, 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 I'm going to put you down. It's a matter of, if you've got a better heckle than me, I'm going to get you a round of applause and we're going to move on, you know? And actually, I love that. I love the fact that people do that. I think it's really important. I don't see it as a... I don't see heckling as a challenge. I see it as joining in. Well, that's a reframe. And I, I completely agree because if you enjoy it, by the way, that that's, the, I always think the old comedy store training, which I always say is let, let it come and enjoy it. And by the way, very often, if it's funny, you've got a microphone and if you repeat it, even if it's taking the piss out of you. You still get the laugh. You share I mean, it. Yeah, yeah. But more than that, you go, come on, give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. You fucker. Give him a yeah. round, you know. <laughs> and you've got, you've suddenly turned it into a game. You've taken it out of being a battle and you've turned it into a game. This is all about the most fundamental thing that we do, which is play. We play. We muck about. We experiment. We try things. We fuck about for the sake of it. We play. That's why you have work and play where we do the stuff that we have to do and we have to put all the square blocks in the square holes and we get play where we can try and put oranges yeah, you know, wherever we want frankly sometimes it gets a bit ridiculous especially if you're a Tory but <laughs> you know that's the point that's the point you, it's about playing it's about mucking around and if you create that atmosphere that we can play and that actually if you're really good at the game you'll get a round of applause well, that's what I think you do is I, I was going to say you bring a playfulness. You you actually embody the playfulness. We're going to have fun and you are having fun. So going back to if you want anyone to go into any state, you have to go into that mm -hmm. state. For, and so we're going, this is fun, going to be fun. And all of us are going back to childhood, regressing and going, oh, we're going to play. Yes, that's exactly it. And if you sit there going, well, I'll be the judge of that. You're you're just you're the sour face on the table. Do you know what I mean? That's what it is. Um, and I think you're right. It is about play. It is about fun. And it is about silliness. Uh, even in the most, you know, e even in the most sort of like. Political. Moments, you can be silly. You should be silly. You should muck around. We had uh, a, a rock star on the show, Luke Pritchard of The Kooks, you know, the band The Kooks. And Luke was on. And um, he talked about, he said, I saw Mick Jagger when I was young and I thought, isn't it great that he can be so silly? And I wanted to be silly. And I'd never thought about the silliness aspect of it. But he kind of, and I'm like, of course, but silly can be sexy. Well, I mean, I think you've only got to look at bands like um, the sensational Alex Harvey band, where Alex oh, Harvey used to come on stop. as Moses and yeah. sing, sing the text. <laughs> you know, he was amazing. He, he you know, it, it, the, all of that, or bands like the Tubes who used to have, you know, dress up and all of this kind of stuff. All of it is about play and engagement. I think it's... Um, I love watching, this is where the comedy comes from. You know, Billy Connolly started on the folk circuit. Yeah. Singing songs and talking, that's what it is. You know, and and, and what happens is, is that the songs just got lesser and lesser. <laughs> you know, so fewer and fewer. But don't you think there's an intrinsic, um, music and comedy have an intrinsic dependency on rhythm? And uh, which is we would refer to as timing, and and that arguably evokes 
only the correct pause before the punchline and arrives. And really, there's a lot more to it than that. So it's a musicality in our brains, our, yes. a rhythm. You're absolutely right. There is a musicality. I remember seeing Daniel Kitson and he told this gag and it didn't really quite fly. And he goes, oh, I'll get that. I'll get that tomorrow. It's not it's not quite rhythmic enough at the moment. And it was like, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely. Do you think that everyone has the potential to be funny or is it only uh, the gift given to the few? No, everyone has. I mean, everyone is. I mean, that's the thing about it. I When I do, I, I do workshops with people sometimes just, and I say, right, just tell me a story uh, that's one of your family stories. And and what we do is then I put them into small groups and um, <clears throat> get the groups to edit each other. And just go, oh. you're going to be funny by the end of it. Don't worry. You know this story, it's fine. We're just going to tell you about the bits that you don't need to tell because they don't serve any purpose for getting a laugh. So it's the mechanics of that. And I, the other thing I would add into that, which sounds like what you're doing, is you're giving them the quiet confidence to be able to do that. You work in small groups, you move it forward, you take them out to bigger groups. You know, um, w w me and my mate Ed, Ed, there's a wonderful chap called Ed who I work with, who is a playwright, but he also runs... Um, a short film course at the Accept and Recovery Centre in Manchester, which is quite literally in the shadow of strange ways. And um, Ed and I are no stranger to recovery ourselves. So we're working with people who are in recovery and people in recovery tell their stories all the time, but they tell those horrible harrowing stories that they need to tell. And we go to them, have a laugh, come tell a story that's a laugh. Just tell us a story that's funny that made you laugh. Uh, and some of the stories are hysterical. They're brilliant. And these are people in recovery, you know, to greater or lesser degree. Some people with real damage, some people who, who are getting there. And and actually, we're really, we're really proud because two of the kids on the course have got into college, which is brilliant, which is really, really exciting. Oh, that's wonderful. Is that, is that, is that because there is something really powerful about being able to laugh at yourself. Yeah. There's something brilliant about being able to see that you can laugh at yourself, that you can create a laughter for about you and that you can create a story. And then that story will be taken seriously enough to get in actors and cameramen and editors and women who will be, you know, filming that. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. and they'll make these little short films of them, and this, and in the act of making the short film, it's not only a discipline where they're learning things, uh, but it's also this thing about your existence is worth it. So that's kind of like the I have the confidence that it is worth it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, one of the funniest sessions that was done. Somebody, Ed basically said, we're going to do a session today. Is it just, just what, by way of, what advice would you give someone who was thinking of taking heroin for the first time? The results were fucking hysterical. <laughs> just hysterical. One person just went, just go up to all your friends and family and say goodbye now. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like this real, and you thought, that was just like years and years and years of fucking suffering that led to that one line. But what a line. Say goodbye now. It's brilliant. But it's also, I, I it's here's, an, here's another thing that, 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 you know, ever since I've known you, I, I, I think one of the things that you are is brave because you, you, you now I know and, and you slightly balked at that, but I think there's a bravery in everything you do. You will go forward. And I think that's where, humor comes from as well is the bravery to try something to say something to put it out there because you have to we, we talked about humor and resilience but there's also the other side of it the bravery to to try this this may not work this may be inappropriate yeah 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 i mean that that i always i i, I told the story the other night of um of being in belfast uh, in 87, 88, and doing a simple routine and, you know, mocking everybody, 
uh, but doing a simple routine of, of uh, about the Pope endorsing contraception. Right, Holy Trinity, pack of three now with water based lubricant, holy water based lubricants, right? And just a silly little simple throwaway. And from the back of the room, someone shouts, What about Mother Teresa? who was alive, right? And she uh, holding up Mother Teresa as this kind of like beacon beyond reproach that you couldn't, you know, that I'd offended their identity and they're holding up Mother Teresa to say, This, this, you cannot get away from the brilliance of this. The, I refute you thus. And if you're on stage, you go with the first thing. And I just went, Best fuck I've ever read. <laughs> and the place just went, <clears throat> And then it burst. And I had to go, I had to be that big. I had to go that big. It was funny as fuck, Paul. It was fucking brilliant. It's a it's a great line, but it's brave. And they just fuck the whole order, it kind of like destroyed anything that was left of a barrier in the room. Do you know what I mean? It just wrecked it. Anyway, years later, I was doing a pro-choice benefit. Uh, me, Josie Long, Robin Ince, and um Bridget Christie, we're doing a pro-choice benefit. It's about six, seven years ago um, in Belfast. After the gig, a woman came up to me and said, excuse me, Mr. Thomas, do you remember that gig where somebody shouted, what about Mother Teresa? I said, I do. She said, that was me. I was like, you're at the wrong gig. You're at the wrong gig. This is a pro-choice gig. You're at the wrong gig. She went, no, no, no. These are my politics. I said, well, why did you I was off my tits on acid. Oh. She said, why didn't you tell me that at the time? She said, Martin McGuinness was sitting two rows in front of me. Who's going to admit to being on drugs in front of fucking Martin McGuinness? Oh, my God, what a story. And I love that. I love that. I love that. You know, every part of that story I adore. It had, You know, because it is just like the wonderful puncturing of any kind of barrier pomposity or anything around us and the fact that everything is fair game and in a fucking city rent asunder by sectarianism where it's all up for grabs oh, yeah. do you know what i mean and that's really exciting and then years later at this rather you know a progressive benefit you know just for health rights for women up comes this woman with the punchline god is that well then it, we go back to stories about you know what a beautiful story arc that is yeah, it's just, well, that's it. Punch, jokes and stories. It is, but I go back to the bravery as well, because uh, you've you've put yourself out there. I mean, you walked the wall in Israel and that's 723 kilometres long. Oh, yes. And it took three months. So yeah. that takes extraordinary bravery, stamina, endurance. Um, and stupidity. And stupid. Well, maybe. <laughs> But but that's where the comedy comes from, isn't it? That that you you're brave enough to try stuff. I'll tell you something. That walk we walked on both sides of the wall, but we walked predominantly on the Palestinian side uh, because a lot on the Israeli side you'll just get walls, you'll just get roads going straight past. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there'll be motorways. So or, or you it, 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 the the kind of topography of it militates against walking so much on the Israeli side. Um, and, you know, we had really, we were pelted with stones, like proper big rocks. We were arrested by the Israeli army. We thought we were going to be deported. You know, I fell off the side of a mountain of rubble. Um, you know, it just every single day something would go wrong and every single day something would go right, really amazingly right. And... Um, it was one of the most ex amazing experiences of my life. And it, and it, and we're still working with some of the people. One of the places we went past was the Janine Freedom Theatre, which is a theatre in a refugee camp. And, um, and I loved, I loved what they were doing. I loved it. I really fell in love with it. And um, I went and I used to go back there and see the guy who ran it. It was a, a he was half Israeli, half Palestinian. And uh, he, if you got in an argument with someone, go, ah, we Israelis are always like this. And then the next minute he goes, ah, that's us Palestinians. <laughs> you know, he was brilliant. And um, he was actually murdered outside the theatre. He was shot outside the theatre. And this is the important thing about humour and art is that it's a threat. 
It genuinely is a threat. Um, and we went back and there's still work with people. And we spent ages working out how we could go and run a stand-up comedy course. Um, a few years ago, we did it. We went and ran a stand-up comedy course at, from that theatre. Um, and then we put on a stand-up show in the refugee camp, all in Arabic. We put it in Arabic. And uh, then some of the lads who did the show came over and we wrote a play together and toured it. It was called Showtime from the Frontline. And it was all about what that experience was of trying to put on a comedy show and the various forces. It's not just the Israeli occupation. It's the conservativeness of the Palestinian authorities. It's the, this force that you all your stories must be about the struggle. It's a thing that says, you know, men must be men. You know, all of these things, women should be in hijabs and they shouldn't be on stage. You know, all of that, you know, comes all of that was in the show, right? And it was it was really, really exciting. The most wonderful thing for me is that when we finished, the lads went back um, and one of them continues to work with my friend, Dr. Sam Beal, who teaches stand-up at Middlesex. And they are now, and we're working on a thing, it's called Palcom. Um, and it's coming over to Hay on Y and it's coming over to Rich Mix in the East End, uh, which is, we, we've been going over there continually. I haven't so much as Sam and Allah. And they, they've they been teaching comedy courses in to women in Nablus, in, you know, in Bethlehem. And now they're, they're on the verge of building a comedy circuit in the West Bank, in Palestine. And, you know, this is... This stuff is proper stuff. This is the stuff that changes people's lives. Yeah. I love it. And I tell you what, I'm a mouthy old gobshite, but I'm grateful for every moment of it. Here's the question. Do you think humour can be a successful bridge between opposing political leanings? I think you can show people your situation mm. and they can have empathy or not. Um, we had a wonderful, there was a wonderful thing, a, a routine that one of the lads did, which was about the curfew. He said that, and uh, the, every, they put everyone on a curfew and you had to be inside. And he said, and uh, he said, which meant that, the, the, that they had nothing to do. So the father was saying to the mum, they used the word McClubey. Right, McClubie is one of the most popular dishes. It's upside down. And McClubie, it's where you put in the carrots and the onions and the chicken and all of that. And then you put the rice on top and you turn it over and you've got McClubie. And uh, uh, it's about seeing his dad say to his wife, to his mum, do you think we shall have McClubie tonight? And it being the little clue for, for sex. And we were going, we're going to get McClubie. We're going to get, you're not getting McClubie. <laughs> And so they they had this whole thing, and after a while, the um, the the Israelis are looking, and this actually happened. The Israelis are looking and saying that the the Palestinian birth rates are increasing, and they're really worried. The Israeli sort of like uh, government and and institutions are very worried about birth rates. They're very worried about demographics, sure. uh, in a similar way. That in fact more so, I think, than uh, you know the, the 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 kind of entrenched areas of of republicanism and, and unionism in the north um but the, he does this routine about the israelis go what the, why are they breeding so much oh my god and they're all, all the israelis are going around that night go, get out of the house come on party <laughs> and these dads standing at the window going we are having mccluby leave us alone <laughs> and i love that i love that and it's a story about the occupation, but it isn't, it's, it celebrates and it plays with it. And also, I was just thinking that whole thing about that, that humour is, you know, everybody's in tribes and, but humour can, the, the same tribes can, with a story that's humorous, can relate to it, can't it? With luck. Yeah. With luck. I mean, it's kind of like, you can sometimes see, um, you know, I think when uh, when Frank Carson would talk about paddies, 
he wasn't talking about unionists. He was talking about Paddy's Island. He was talking about Republicans. He was talking about nationalists. He was talking about Catholics. Do you know what I mean? So that yeah. when you say people can relate to it, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a difficult punching one. Punching up or punching down or sharing, right? You can't, you, you, you can't punch down and share. Well, which is, uh, brings me on to the whole thing of like um, the use of comedy and in inverted commas, charisma in politics. Um, we've just um, been through the era of Boris Johnson, who I know you're an enormous fan of and you just can't get enough of him. You did say one of my favourite quotes about him at all, which is uh, following Boris Johnson's premiership, we have less international standing than a bag of Haribo. Which, uh, <laughs> I just thought was beautiful and uh, but do you think we're now reliant to a certain extent because now everybody's going you know we need somebody who's um charismatic and fun in order to lead when you know I would just kind of like competent and caring I would agree to you with you the fact that you get you know Berlusconi Trump Johnson they're of a type, you know, the Farage type of, you know, of, of kind of showbiz um, person. And actually, um, what's interesting is that Sunak has no charisma. You know, he, 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 people call him the tech bro. Um, I, I've described him as saying, no, he's not really here. He's not, he's, he's, he's sort of, of offshore do you know what i mean <laughs> with his money yeah so he but i mean that's the, the interesting thing is that they would use bluster and joke as a way of evading responsibility mm. um and johnson you know when he was editor of the spectator you know referred to black people as as picking in his with watermelon smiles. He referred to the city of Liverpool in an editorial as being obsessed with its own victimhood. You know, and this was at a time when Hillsborough had not been properly investigated, you know, and actually it was a scar that ran through that city. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I think the callous glibness with which they attack people, um, the joke is rarely on him. And when it is, it's all fine because I'm still in power. Uh, yes, uh, but there's always that that last um, vestige of like, um, well, you can't take a joke, can you? You know, I, I, I'm i being funny. And that seems to capture a lot of people in, in the same way that Trump seems to capture a lot of people. Well, yes and no. I mean, the fact that Johnson turned number 10 in a Magaluf for COVID while people were burying <laughs> their relatives. Do you know what I mean? That You can't escape that. You can't escape no. that. The fact that he lied every single day, you can't escape. The fact that actually the PPE scandal was there was incredible. The fact that, you know, Brexit wasn't done. It was a mod podge so that he could get into power. That's what it was. Dominic Cummings and Bar you know, the castle, absolute outrage. You know, PPE, absolute outrage. All of these errors, all of these mistakes, all of the corruption. He puts his dad into the House of Lords. Do you know what I mean? Uh, presumably because it's cheaper than a care home. But you look at it and you go, look, you know, this, this, this is remarkable. I'll tell you the thing about it. This is how fucking scared they are, Paul. This is how scared. Democracy isn't just about putting someone in. It's about getting someone out. Mm -hmm. Right? That's an important part of it. Do you know how many elected prime ministers have been publicly voted out of office since 1979? No. One. <sighs> John Major is the only elected prime minister that was publicly voted out. The rest, they've gone, oh, quick, hide them. We, we don't like that one anymore. Get them out of the way. Wow. And actually, it's a betrayal of, of democracy. We're marginally more democratic than the Vatican. That's how we need to look at it. Do you know what I mean? So all 
this power and it's, it's the charisma of power and the power of charisma. They're kind of interchangeable at these moments in time. Actually, what you want is Clement Attlee was known as the accountant. He created the welfare state. He built the NHS. He created council flats. He started decolonializations. His actions led to the nationalizing of the mines, of steelworks, of rebuilding the country. And he was known as the accountant. I'll settle for that. Yeah, me too. But, uh, but also, they, that 20 out of 55 prime ministers went to the same school. I know yeah, that's one of the things we school. should do. I mean, we should ban anyone from eating holding any public office. That's one of my sort of manifesto things that we need to ban it. We just need to stop them doing it. Do you know what I mean? It just, we, it, I, I think this will have a dual effect. One is it will mean that sort of ordinary people will start to, uh, you know, get into, um, into positions of power and hopefully have a degree of empathy with other ordinary people. But also what you get rid of is sociopaths because Eton is basically a, a, what it is, is it is an empathy draining school. It will take out any compassion that you have for anyone else and teach you how to exploit guilt and shame in others. And I think what, what we need to do is, is to regard those people not as future prime ministers, but as damaged individuals who need to be institutionalised and helped on the road to recovery. But well, it's very, but what they are doing, um, I agree with that, but what they are doing is they are giving them all the tools to um, take power, which we talked about in humour yeah. terms, uh, confidence. Yeah. By the time you can, you are considered to be uh, somebody who is worthy of power if you have that level of confidence. Yeah, it is, it's going to come to them. It's expected. It's entitlement. Yeah, yeah. which is, uh, you know, we're, we're not getting many laughs out of this, are we? No, no, you're absolutely right. But look, <laughs> the point is, is that they use comedy as a way of exploiting, uh, of getting people to, 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 to humanise themselves. Yeah. But I mean, it's fear or, or or comedy. Those are the two things you've got if you're a leader. Yeah, and uh, but uh, but bizarrely, they are the most. They keep talking about freedom of speech until it's something they don't like to hear, and which yeah. then they become incredibly thin-skinned about the whole thing. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Freedom of speech is something that works one way. Um, you know. <clears throat> I remember having an argument with someone who said I criticised a comic for what they said about um, one of Britain's swimming team. It was a woman swimmer, and they referred to her as a porpoise. And I said, you're just the other side of the coin from the Daily Mail, judging women's bodies. And another comic jumped in and said, you're just there clamping down on freedom of speech. They said, no, freedom of speech is him saying it and me saying that to him. That's what it is. Yeah, no, I agree. Anyway, Mark, we've reached a point in the show which we like to call quick fire questions. Okay, I've reached the point where I'm thinking, oh, I've missed my lunch by about an hour. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll this will no, be quite quick, quick fire, fire questions. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> quick fire questions. Aside from comics, who's the funniest person? that you've met they could be in business it could be on a building site it could be in charities uh one of the funniest people i've ever met is my mate pete who was uh i met at wakefield uh, at, at drama school who was just genius he was a teacher but he was just the funniest he was just the funniest bloke uh and just fearless absolutely fearless he was an amazing bloke. we did um we found out um he used to run the student union. We found out the principal of the student union, uh, the principal of the college had been to South Africa and broken the sanctions during the apartheid era. Uh, and he was also an architect was this principal. And we drew a picture on the front thing of him selling cardboard flexi ghettos to Soweto inhabitants, right? And okay. published it. We also did this whole thing about where he was taking students artworks and saying, I'm gonna hang them in my office so people can see it and you'll get benefit from it. But actually he was hanging it in his house just to decorate it. And we made a comparison with another art collector in the thirties. So he, <laughs> um, 
he went fucking nuts at us and called us in. And he says, I could sue you. I could sue every one of you. And my mate Pete, who is the union official, went, that'll look good in Guardian, wouldn't it? And it's like, <laughs> changed overnight. Pete was genius. He could make anything funny. He was great. My mate Ewan was very funny. We used to be in this theatre group together, which uh, was called Armchair Theatre, and we banned rehearsals. Band, you wrote the show, but you only wrote it and then you went and improvised around it because we thought rehearsals were bourgeois. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were shit, but um, he was the he was just absolutely genius. One of the funniest guys that I've met, in fact, was Paul Kenny as trade union leader, who's now in the House of Lords. And I'll tell you why he was funny. I saw him do a speech um, about health and safety. And he walked into this meeting late and it was in a, a labor club and there's loads of bottles and drinks on the table. And he just goes, right. And said, please, Paul Kenny, you walked in at the right moment. And Paul walks in straight up to speak. And he goes, management think they know what they're talking about when it comes to health and safety. That's bollocks. And he moves a few glasses around on the table. He said, I remember my first induction meeting and working with dangerous chemicals. He said, the bloke leading the instruction, uh, leading the, the session, said the most important thing, and he moves a few glasses, he said the most important thing is knowing what substances you're working with. And with that, he picked up a bottle and inhaled deeply. It was me that called the ambulance. Now, <laughs> when he told that gag, you could see just years of trying to get people's attentions in a canteen. Oh, yeah. And he was brilliant. He was, he was funny as hell. He was amazing. My mm. Uncle David was brilliant. My Uncle David was hysterical. He, 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 he was just genius. He, I mean, he was also deeply traumatised from the war, but he was the funniest bloke. You know, and he was... I always remember him sitting there during the Falklands thing, you know, and everyone was sitting, getting drunk, blah, blah, blah. We've got to have Sunday lunchtime, blah, blah. Got to go in there, show him what's right. And everyone would go around the table having their say. My Uncle David would go, it's always them that's, that's never been that are first to shout for it. He was from the North. That my, he was from the, he was Judy. So all those people, I love all of that. My sister's funny. My sister's a vicar, right? Oh. We've got lots of vicars in our family. And she came in late the other day. I said, where have you been? She goes, oh, Mark, don't. I've had to get rid of the donkey after the Easter service. <laughs> this is just great. Oh, bless. I love all oh. of that. Yeah. What book makes you laugh? Um, I think anything by Spike Milligan. Spike Milligan always makes me laugh. Always, like, giggling uncontrollably. John Cooper Clarke's book oh. is funny as hell. Brilliant. It's genius. Describing yeah. Weetabix with its colonic scouring integrity, its colonic scouring abilities intact, the breakfast of the worried well. You know, it's just these beautiful descriptions everywhere. I, I, I mean, Cooper Clark makes me laugh. I've got, let's have a look. I'll tell you what else makes me laugh is The Good Soldier's Fight by Yaroslav Hasek. That still makes me giggle to this day. Um, okay. But definitely, I think David Niven, uh, Bill, um, sorry, who is it? It's not David Niven. John Niven. John, uh, Dave, okay. David, Niven, David Niven, the moons are blue. Niven, it, Niven is the writer who wrote um, Kill Your Friends, which is about the record industry, which is really funny. Oh, I haven't read that. I must read it. That. It's, it's yeah. really good stuff. Oh, um, what film makes you laugh? Um, well, loads of films. I mean, you know, I, I, I still love bringing up Baby. I think that's one of the greatest films ever. You know, Cary Grant and, and Kathy, I can't bring you anything but love, baby. Sing to the panther. You know, the leopard and all the characters <laughs> in it, I think are great. I love that. I love the Blues Brothers. How can you not laugh at the Blues Brothers? It's just a monumental film. Um, I think Takashi Miike, who's Japanese director, who is so out there, it's incredible. I took the kids to see one of his movies called The Blade of the Immortal, which is a Shanbara, which is a Japanese sword fight film. And um, it starts with this, with this sword fight, right? 
and it's in black and white. And this guy takes on all these gangsters, all these, well, they're not gangsters, they're the, the kind of mythical figures from feudal Japan. And it's just like hundreds of people dying, dying slashes and heads going off and arms up in the air and every bits are going off everywhere. And then he's dying of injuries on the floor. And this, this sort of wizard, sort of witch hag appears and goes, I will now let you live forever. These are Tibetan bloodworms that will make you invincible. And she puts the worms in and they reform all over the things. And suddenly you just see this splash of blood and it goes blade of the immortal and all the kids and I, I just lent in and went <laughs> and it was the funniest you know what i mean those things are funny as hell those moments where you just like jackie chan jackie chan has me laughing all the time he's i mean seriously any movie he's in well no matter how crap it is and he's done over 150 films God. right yeah. so it, some of them i'd say everything everywhere all at once is fucking hysterical have you seen it no, it's got not yet. Yo in it. It's absolutely brilliant. This sort of like multiverse of, uh, uh, but very, very funny. At one point, they're going to this sword fight and everything's in this psychedelic, anything can happen. And this woman suddenly appears with sex toys. It's this kind of like martial art thing. Hilarious. It's brilliant. That yeah. makes me laugh a lot. Uh, I tell you, Hitchcock always has a good laugh. There's always a good laugh in a Hitchcock film. Takashi Miike which has always got shock laughs in his. I'm, I'm trying to get a, a laugh out of Hitchcock. I'm trying to think of the birds and if there's the laughs in the birds. There's always a laugh. If you remember Rear Window, there's always he's always got these sentimental little bits where the 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 exercise woman who keeps on having men coming into the apartment and she keeps trying to slap them because they keep trying to make passes at her. Her her boyfriend comes in. He's this little tubby fella. Do you know what I mean? And she's like, ah! you know, there's always a laugh in there somewhere. Oh, uh, right there. All right, we're going to take a shift to the other side now, very briefly. What is not funny? I think we've touched on it already. The things that I don't find funny are victimising people at the bottom of the pile, people who've been traumatised, people who've, who, who've got nothing, taking the piss out of... I've, I hated Little Britain because it would mock... You know, to just mock someone's skin, the colour of their skin, to mock people being poor. It was just like, you know, shut the fuck up. You've got really well-paid jobs. Go and take the piss out of actors. Yeah. Good. What word makes you laugh? Um, the one that makes me smile is my mate Peter's. When I came in... <laughs> came in with the Mohican to college and he just went, what the fuck is that tonsorial aberration? <laughs> tonsorial? Tonsorial aberration. Ton amongst tonis, it was the round bit of a... Okay, well, you see, I, you had to you educate me there because I was like, what, I've never heard the word tonsorial. Tons but it was, what the fuck is to that tonsorial aberration? I love, I love that. I think that, that there's lots of, uh, uh, after gigs, what happens is, right, and Teen will tell you this, because when she's tour managing me, you know Teen, right, yeah. who goes to football, who's also my lover. I love using that word. I'm nearly 60. And I love, I've got a lover, you know. So um, <clears throat> I actually wanted her to call me her consort, but she refused. <laughs> consort, there's a great word. That's a fabulous yeah. word. Yeah. What's your console? Oh, yeah, consorting all night. We was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love consorts, a great word. I like it. Is. No, no, it's a great word. What sound makes you laugh? <laughs> or I tell you what other sounds is. Um, because after gigs, this was what I was going to tell you. We always have this thing where I'm on stage for two hours. You know, you come back, you're signing books, you're chatting to people, you get in the car, you're off. You know, you've got time to get the wet wipes out and go around your nethers before you jump into the car. And then you're, you're driving back home. And I always have an hour where I just do poems, songs, make things up, uh, talk to team, uh, start telling the important things, forget about it, start a joke, tell a story, go back to telling the poem. And she calls it the brain dump. Yeah. And what I love are just making, so I'll make up songs and limericks. Teen actually recorded me the other night. 
she she woke me up and said i recorded your limericks just before you went to sleep because <laughs> i i want because all these people i because i was laughing because all these people at the lawn festival are all saying i've written a poem and i said i want to get up there and go i have written a poem too there was a young lady from Bo. <laughs> <laughs> And I start making up all these lyrics, just nonsense. I love all of that. The sounds I like, I think. I think. A, a, a... How about when a goal goes in at Wimbledon? It's a rare sound these days, but. Oh, I'll tell you what else makes me laugh is the your shit. Ah, and how long the R's go on for. And it just, I love that. It becomes like a pirate thing, doesn't it? <laughs> That's make me laugh as well. I love all of that. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Funny. All day long? I think you have to be a little bit clever, or rather clever, in fact, to be funny. I'll be clever of an evening. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, Mark, yes. desert island gags. You can only take one gag with you to a desert island. What is it? That's a question. I think the gag that I would take with me is um, Dave Allen's routine, which he did in front of LWT Studio. And it was when he was doing his LWT days. So officially he was past his prime, but he was fantastic. And he said, I get into trouble for telling Irish jokes. I get into a lot of trouble. But I'll tell Irish jokes. What's the point if you can't laugh at yourself? And the audience gave a round of applause. Oh, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself. Don't you agree? Hey, I'll tell Irish jokes. Sodom. Got two paddies. Leave Dublin. Go to work in London. The IQ of D Dublin halves overnight. Right, big round of applause. You've got to be able to laugh at yourself. Don't you agree? Yay. Hey, when they get to London, the IQ doubles. Silence. And he turns and looks at the audience and said, I thought we'd agreed. You've got to be able to laugh at yourself. Beautiful. Bigotry straight on the jaw. Oh. It was, it, it was a moment where you saw the power of comedy. I absolutely love that. And I love spending time with you because... I love spending time with you, mate. Uh, so, well, well, you know what? You are the baboon with the brightest eyes. <laughs> that is going on a poster. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Thomas, thank you so much for being a wonderful guest on the Humorology Podcast. Thanks for having me. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros, produced by David Rose. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.